How was tobacco used by natives in the U.S. before contact? We all know that tobacco comes from indigenous Americans, but smoking it was not the only way that they used it. Disclaimer, this video is about historical uses of tobacco by indigenous peoples of the Americas and is in no way meant to promote the use of tobacco. Tobacco is addictive, smoking it is harmful, and the preparations of wild tobacco described in this video may be damaging to one's health. I do not recommend one use tobacco in any way. It is widely insufflated or inhaled or blown up the nostrils among indigenous South Americans. The Kwayasu actually use it mostly orally, usually only smoking it before bed or for ceremonial uses. But oral or nasal use of tobacco can't be done with just the tobacco leaves. You have to treat it with the chemical lime to raise its pH so it can be absorbed by the oral mucosa. Indigenous peoples throughout the Americas figure this out making lime by burning shells or pit-firing limestone or travertine. This cooks carbon dioxide out of the calcium carbonate, leaving quick lime, which you can basically trap for use by getting it wet and drying it, leaving you with slaked lime. The common tobacco is Nicotiana tobaccum, which is probably native to the Andes in South America. This is the commercial tobacco that you can buy anywhere. Aztec tobacco, Nicotiana rustica, has up to nine times more nicotine than common tobacco and was historically cultivated by indigenous peoples in North and South America. It's usually known as mapacho when smoked and rapé when snuffed, but it was also drunk as a juice or administered via enema. And there are many other Nicotiana species, including five native to the U.S. and ten more introduced ones. There are countless descriptions of natives using tobacco in countless ways, but I want to give you just how one tribe did it. Because in all of my years studying American Indian ethnobotany, I had never read such a detailed account of a historical, essentially pre-contact, use of tobacco until this one on the Kawaiasu, whose historical territory was just east of Bakersfield, California, in the Tehachapi Mountains. The Kawaiasu highly prized the local native wild tobacco species, Indian tobacco, or Nicotiana quadrivalvis. Coyote tobacco, Nicotiana attenuata, was also found in the area, but it was hardly worth their time compared to the much more potent Indian tobacco. The Kawaiasu appear to have gathered the plant wild, though they also sometimes burned and weeded areas to improve plant growth. In late summer, they started pruning leaves, with three prunings, each a week apart, as the leaves approached maturity. At the first pruning, they removed the small, weak leaves, new growth at the juncture of the large leaves and the stalks, and the flowering tops. At the second and third pruning, the same parts were removed, but after the third one, there were only large, healthy leaves left. After five days, these last leaves were removed. And it's unclear if only these last leaves were used or if the pruned foliage was used for any purpose. But these large leaves, they were wrapped in bundles, tied with willow shoots, and kept for three to four days. They also may have been kept in baskets for this period. After the leaves were spread out to dry in the sun, being shuffled about daily until they were fully dry. The dried leaves were powdered in a bedrock mortar, with the finest powder being sifted out with a basketry tray. And care was taken to avoid wind to prevent the inhalation of the powder while pounding it. A concoction was made to moisten the meal to form cakes or plugs. This concoction was a decoction of fresh tobacco leaves with a few Pinus sabiniana seeds some bee honey, and a leaf or two of Dendromecon rigida. This concoction was slowly added to the powdered tobacco with enough added to allow the mixture to be molded in the hands or a form into plugs measuring about three to four inches long, two to three inches wide, and one to two inches thick. The plugs were dampened daily for several days until they turned almost black and then were dried for several days. This plug was ready to be broken apart and used for smoking, which was typically only done at nighttime to induce sleep and dreams or for ceremonial use. Pipes were made with the hollow stems of Phragmites aerogonum or Lonicera, that's uh, reed, buckwheat, and honeysuckle. To use it orally, a piece of the plug was broken off, ground in a small matate, and mixed with lime. 
Historically, lime was made by roasting shells on an open fire or pit firing limestone rock or travertine, then adding water to form a paste that was dried into a cake that could be easily powdered. The tobacco and lime was mixed in a small stone bowl and was tasted to check the proper proportions. It was ready to use or was stored in containers made of hollowed sections of elderberry stems. To administer the powder, it was licked or it was moistened, rolled into small pellets, and placed in the mouth. The juice was spat out or swallowed. The dry powder was also used as a snuff, being insufflated up the nostrils. The powder or pellets were also eaten, though it would cause hiccuping or vomiting. The smoking and oral use of pellets were both soporific, sleep-inducing, and commonly used as such. Tobacco was used for recreational, medicinal, and ceremonial purposes. The powder was also applied to cuts to stop bleeding and on insect bites to stop itching. It was insufflated to induce sneezing for a stuffy nose and headache relief, or inserted into ears for earache, or wrapped in cloth and held on a toothache for relief, or swallowed to cause vomiting. A pellet was placed on the end of a long willow stick that was rammed into a rattlesnake's mouth to render it lifeless. So tobacco was one of the most important plants among most indigenous peoples throughout all of the Americas, so this is a drop in the bucket as far as its uses but it does give a fascinating glimpse into how some native groups in the U.S. may have used wild tobacco. If you like this kind of stuff for five bucks, you can access my full Patreon catalog, which is a year's worth of uh, posts per week, and I'll continue posting exclusive stuff there. All right, thanks for watching. I'll take it easy.